I would now invite Patrick Riley to speak. Now the Acting High Commissioner to New Zealand, Patrick's had a varied career in diplomacy, including stints in South Africa and Afghanistan. Please join me in welcoming Patrick Riley. Thank you and uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, where I work at the British High Commission in Wellington, in our rare moments of rest and relaxation, we sometimes play a game called what is Britain's greatest export? The most popular answer is often the steam engine and the train that it allowed, or a combination of the jet engine and radar, which made modern flight possible. We do, however, have one romantic who claims that the hovercraft, in the long run, will be more important than either the train or the jet plane. Time will tell. Then we have colleagues who argue for antibiotics, IVF, the computer, the telephone, the television, the World Wide Web, and even the humble electric light bulb. We have an economist who argues for Adam Smith, and a driver who insists that Britain's greatest export are the Beatles, or the Rolling Stones, depending on what mood he's in. Our science promoter at the British High Commission can never decide between Isaac Newton or Charles Darwin. Can you imagine a world without gravity or evolution? Thank God for the British. And our security guard, Solly, insists that Britain's greatest export is sport. Maybe that's because one of his sons used to captain the All Blacks. And it was Solly who told me that of the ten most popular sports in the world, nine of them were codified by the British. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, rugby is a British export. <laughs> and at the Rugby World Cup final at Twickenham in October, we intend to re-import it. <laughs> like the hovercraft, time will tell. So ladies and gentlemen, when over the next nine minutes I argue that the Magna Carta is still Britain's greatest export, I am keenly aware of the competition. But let me try. I have three arguments, all of them brief. First, the impact argument. The fact that 800 years on, I am standing just about as far away from Runnymede as it's possible to be, taking part in a lecture series involving some of this country's most distinguished public figures, suggests strongly that Magna Carta has made its mark. The Great Charter was agreed by King John and his rebellious barons to end a vicious and brutal civil war, what we diplomats would call a frank exchange of views. Who hath ever heard the like, wrote monks in the oldest known account of events at Runnymede. For the body desired to rule the head, the people would govern their king. Magna Carta returned to significance again in the 17th century, when England was racked by another civil war involving another autocratic king. At the same time, settlers from the British Isles, including the Pilgrim Fathers, were sailing to colonise lands in the New World and taking with them a fundamental belief in their rights as set out in the, Ragna, in the Magna Charta. These ideas strongly influenced the 1776 Declaration of Independence and the newly formed United States' own Bill of Rights 20 or so years later. Indeed, the esteem in which Magna Carta is held by Americans is demonstrated by its beautiful depiction on the golden doors of the US Supreme Court. And until recently, the only Magna Carta monument at Runnymede was one donated by the American Bar Association. If Magna Carta's influence had remained solely within the English-speaking world and the Commonwealth, then its legacy would be remarkable enough. But that influence was multiplied many times over through the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Elena Roosevelt, the wife of the late US president who chaired the committee that drafted the Universal Declaration, described the declaration as, quote, the international Magna Carta for all mankind. And indeed, the similarities of language are unmistakable. That is the impact argument, ladies and gentlemen. Now for the simplicity argument. All great things have simplicity at their core. The aforementioned Isaac Newton and Charles Darwin, both products of the University of Cambridge in England, provided answers to questions that had stumped the greatest mind since time immemorial. But their answers were remarkable for their simplicity and their clarity. Even those, of us, even those of us educated at the University of Oxford must bear a grudging respect to the achievements of these Cambridge graduates. To the modern reader, the significance of Magna Carta's 63 clauses is hard to distinguish. There is much about the freedom of church, about inheritance rights, about rules and about weights and measures, and about who can fish in the River Thames. But then you get to clauses 39 and 40, which I'm sure have been quoted already this week, but do bear worth quoting again. 
No free man is to be arrested or imprisoned or disguised or outlawed or exiled or in any way ruined, nor will we go or send against him, except by the legal judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. And clause 40, to no one will we sell, to no one will we deny or delay right or justice. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, in two simple clauses, the foundation of the rule of law, which still forms the basis of our legal systems. My third argument, ladies and gentlemen, is the receptiveness argument. Let me explain what I mean. Some historians believe that King John has an undeserved reputation, that he was, in fact, an unfairly maligned victim of Britain's greatest ever practitioner of public relations, marketing, and brand management, more commonly known as Robin Hood. <laughs> but one thing on which historians do agree is that King John was one of the many kings of, English, king of, kings of England who did not speak English. He spoke medieval French, as did all our kings and barons for hundreds of years after the Norman invasion of 1066. As Chris has mentioned, the Magna Carta was written in Latin, a language given to us by the Romans. The Romans also gave us the name of our state, Britannia became Britain, and the name of our capital city, Londinium. Those of us lucky enough to come from, from Britain's greatest city, Manchester, are still called Mancunians because of the Roman name given to the city that they founded. In turn, the Romans were overwhelmed by the barbarians, including the Angles, who came from Germany. From these Angles, we get England as a country and English as a language. William of Orange oversaw the Glorious Revolution and the Bill of Rights of 1689 that cemented modern England as a constitutional monarchy. He was another king of England who could not speak English. He was, of course, Dutch. William of Orange was succeeded by the Hanoverian kings, Georges I, II, III, and IV, who went on to create modern Britain. They were, of course, Germans. George I was another king of England who couldn't speak English. The point here, ladies and gentlemen, is that Britain's constitutional development, before, during, and after the Magna Carta, has always been a multinational process. One of the reasons why Britain, a country, let us not forget, that is smaller than New Zealand, has been so influential in exporting ideas, people, and things to the world is because Britain has been so receptive to ideas, people, and things from the world. That receptiveness, that openness, has been a source of strength. Magna Carta is great not just because it is British, but because the greatness of that simple idea at its core is universal. And it is a simple idea, ladies and gentlemen, that also provides us with a model for the future. Last year, we saw one European country annex the territory of another for the first time since the Second World War. Meanwhile, in this region, territorial disputes over uninhabited rocks have the potential to spark an international confrontation. And with nations connected like never before, there are few parts of the world that can consider themselves safe from the contagious effects of conflict. That's why, in the 21st century, the best hope of resolving these challenges lies in a rules-based international system. This means that nations, in how they conduct themselves internationally, are driven by rules, not power. Abiding by the rule of law on land, on sea, in the air, in space, and perhaps most importantly of all, in cyberspace. Of course, we cannot entirely avoid disagreements between countries, but we can try to contain those disagreements within the dispute resolution mechanisms of international organisations the UN, ASEAN, the EU, the African Union. Avoiding the conflicts that so scarred the 20th century would be a truly enormous prize. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have used impact, simplicity and receptiveness to argue that the Magna Carta is still Britain's greatest export, that we as citizens of the Commonwealth are the fortunate inheritors of its legacy, and that the simple idea at its heart provides a rule for global as well as constitutional politics. Let me finish with a well-known quote from one of my favourite British exports, albeit one who was half American. Those brutal and self-interested men at Runnymede 800 years ago might be surprised to hear me use these words to describe their actions. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Ladies and gentlemen, I rest my case. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. Yeah, an international rule of law is indeed a profoundly valuable legacy of Magna Carta and one which 
I think everyone aspires to.